it seems like every digital marketing expert is now a podcaster. I'm not sure what has given everyone the itch, but I'm delighted to see so many of my peers doing the same as me and sharing their knowledge with their guests. I'm super happy to have you listening in to this episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks, which is the digital marketing podcast where Jim and his guests share stories about bad decisions they've made, how it impacted their career, and what to do to avoid making the same bad decisions. With other digital marketing podcasts, everything is rainbows and unicorns. But on this podcast, we discuss uncomfortable topics in the hope that we can steer you away from costly errors, both personally and professionally. Today, we're talking to Emmanuel Sinker, or Manu to his friends. Manu is a twice-failed university student and former professional poker player who co-authored a best-selling poker book. Thankfully, he failed university the first time, which led him to try business administration at university in Vienna, Austria. And even though the degree didn't work out, he loved Vienna enough to call it his home now. Manu started Stack Marketer as a free, expertly curated digital marketing newsletter in 2018. And since then, he has grown his audience to over 100,000 marketers who read at least one of the free newsletters Stack Marketer publishes every week. So good to have you on the show today, Manu. How have you been? Hey, Jim. Thanks for having me. Great to be chatting again. It's, uh, it's been a while. It has. So what have, what have you been up to since, since we last spoke? Because I, I tried to have you on as a guest on my Elite Media Buyers podcast that I tried to get off the ground. So what, what have you been up to since then? It's probably about just over a year ago, I guess, maybe. Yeah, uh, I, I guess the biggest thing is, so still Stack Marketer, definitely the only focus that I have when it comes to business uh, still. But the biggest differences are kind of in, in what Stack Marketer is, I would say. We used to be, back when we first talked about it, or like when we last talked about it, we were one newsletter focused on digital marketers. Now, since then, we're three newsletters, so two more newsletters broke the 100,000 uh, marketers subscribed to one of our newsletters, Mark, as well this year. And just recently, we had a pretty major upgrade launching in terms of like, you know, website user experience, email templates, like complete revamp, revamp of everything that we've used, that we were using to try to make content consumption more enjoyable for, for our readers. But yeah, so it's it's been a... Busy couple of weeks for me, but I guess it's great that we managed to find the time to to chat here. And as the podcast is called Bad Decisions, there's definitely quite a few bad decisions that we're having both in this past year, but also even before that we can talk about. So, so obviously you've transitioned from failing university, poker player. What was your route into digital marketing and obviously now basically publishing? I mean, I, I guess for all to and tens purposes, you're a publisher now, right? So what, what was your kind of journey? Yeah, yeah that... So back in high school, I was pretty much interested in computer science programming. So programming was the thing that I was most interested in high school. That went pretty well overall. So I, I thought that I wanted to study programming in university. Didn't like it that we were kind of going back to basics. Like it felt like I'm wasting my time because I already know more. So like for some reason, even though I was studying in like a intensive computer programming high school when going to university, even though it was engineering and IT and programming, we kind of went back to square one of like basics. So if someone comes from a non-programming high school, they could still follow through. And I'm like, yeah, this is, this is not what I want to do. So I quit that. And then just at the same time, I was playing poker. So I quit that, focused more on playing poker professionally, making some money, meeting some people, some of which are still business partners with me to this day. So that, that was a major benefit of uh, poker for me. And I thought, okay, let's try business administration, see how it goes. Didn't like that quite much either because you kind of get the theoretical side of things. And I was like, again, okay, but you've not started a business. How you can teach me how to start a business or like run a business if you have, you're just teaching it from theory, right? So that, that those kind of aspects made me more entrepreneurial in a way. Like I just wanted to be more hands-on with things. And then when moving to Vienna, we started a software development company based on a little bit of my history in high school with programming with other poker players. But as you can imagine, business doesn't go as you expect, expect it. So we had some pivots, we had some attempts of this and that. One thing led to another, one of which ended up being digital marketing, right? So the good thing with digital marketing, especially when you look at the affiliate marketing space, you can, if you learn how to do the marketing side of things, you can promote other people's products, get paid a commission. So that was my introduction to the marketing space, I would say, for, for the biggest part of things. Of course, you kind of try to learn some marketing for your own startup, but that's the, the main one. 
And and what, I mean, what sort of time frame? When when was that that you first started dabbling with affiliate marketing? Affiliate marketing was twenty fifteen. Well, it's been a while because <laughs> I'm realizing we're 2024 now. So it always felt like, ah, just a few years ago, maybe. But yeah, that was in 2015, um, like summer 2015, approximately, like that time frame. Yeah. Some things didn't work out within the team, had to look for different things to do, like pivoting a few things. And then that, that was one of the things to test out and uh, worked out pretty well. It's kind of how I started, you know, attending some of the conferences that you also went to. So introduced me to this affiliate marketing and then digital marketing space as it expanded. Yeah. So, so how did you eventually then transition into becoming a publisher? So what was, what was your route to doing that? Yeah, well, if you're an affiliate, you promote other people's products and then you don't really have that much control of how good the product is, what happens after. It's a very, like, it's a, it's a very narrow part that you do. And I really, really thought that I want to just, I want to create a product myself where I can control the user experience as much as possible. So like, create a great product overall. And then that that's kind of the mindset shift when I was like, okay, yeah, affiliate marketing, that's, you know, that's nice and all, but I want to have my own product. And then to reach Stack Marketer took a while in terms of, took a few months. I just went to the drawing board, literally made a list of things that I could try out and then ran traffic to that, right? So let's say essentially doing the whole thing where you don't create the whole product and then you launch it but more like, you know, you have the concept of the product and you pre-launch waiting lists or like, let's say lead magnets that you could build. That's the, the, the initial step into your product, things like that and saw what works best. And at the same time, also when doing this research, I ran into a newsletter called Morning Brew, which back then was very much focused on finance. I still enjoy business. I enjoy finance. So I was like, oh, this is cool. Is there anything like this for, for marketers like us, like for myself? Google did try to find Nope, there was not something in that concept back then. And then I just thought, okay, let me try to make it. Opened up a Google Doc, tried to look through news, what would be relevant to me, try to put it into you know a nice format, try to put it into a nice uh, tone, then hit up uh, friends in the digital marketing space, hit up affiliates and telling them like, look, check this out. Let me know what you think, implementing their feedback. And within like, you know, three, four weeks of getting this feedback, implementing some changes, we've launched it publicly. And it went well, just sharing it within some communities and groups. And we got a few, like, I think like four to 500 subscribers within the first week of launching it in, you know, the, the usual groups that, you know, like some Facebook groups, some paid communities sharing on socials, a few friends sharing it as well. So that was a really promising start that that's kind of how we saw that this has the most promise. And I, it's the product that was the most, where I could contribute the most because it was a topic that I know and I still like a lot. Right. So. If you think of, let's say, and you were at the level that you were doing it or plan to do it, right? So, yeah, yeah, exactly. So that was one of the hurdles back then where talking to other people when saying like, Hey, I'm doing a newsletter. They're like, no, I, I don't want these like spammy things, like like list of links and spam anymore. Like, what do you mean? And I was like, I don't know, can you just read this? It's like, oh, I don't have to like necessarily link out. Like, I don't have to go out of this. This is fun. Like, oh, it's interesting. Oh, you, you get it. Like, this is how I, like the whole point was to create it at a tone that's kind of like talking privately to with a friend from the industry. So that's kind of like our guideline uh, to begin with. Like, you're not talking, we don't, we don't talk to everyone. We talk to the person reading it. So yeah. that, that adds a lot of personality. Yeah. So I, I've, I've got to say, so one of the things I really, really like about your business and your business model is you've kind of adopted this ethos of building in public, right? So, you know, you, it, it's amazing that the fact that you're uh, quite happy to share so openly all of the the kind of challenges, pitfalls, and everything else, but also the kind of the revenue growth. And I mean, the revenue growth has been phenomenal mm -hmm. for your business. Why did you decide that you wanted to kind of share those revenue stats and everything so publicly? What what was what was it that kind of made you think, well, that's a good good idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go public and share all that information. <laughs> and there was a few reasons. And even some people said like, yeah, you shouldn't share because, you know, it's private. But the, the main reasons I thought about doing it is I think that the marketing space is definitely one. It's not the only one. And don't get me wrong with that. There's every space has its bad actors. But I think the marketing space specifically has a lot of uh, people selling dreams and such where they, you know, the get rich quick type of promotions there. And that makes people skeptical about anything that has to do with marketing. And I wanted to show like, yeah, look, 
we're not trying to sell you the dream or anything. We will try our best to, you know, get you knowledge that can improve your marketing results, but it's not selling a dream. And also we'll, to kind of say that we walk the walk as well, we're sharing our results. So you can see like where we're coming from, what we managed to do, you know, and then kind of taking it from there. So this transparency part was kind of brought up by that. I thought it can create more trust within everyone who reads and like everyone who is part of the community in, in the digital marketing community, which is quite large. So that was one reason. Second reason is we noticed that our readers in general can give us some very productive feedback. So we made things, like we did things that were not, you know, as good as it can be, like we made some mistakes in the early days that people were like, Hey, you know, I don't appreciate this. I don't like that. And here are the reasons why. And I noticed that people are, you know, very like, you, even though it's negative feedback in some way, it's a cr critique, but people probably took like half an hour of their day to write like some really serious critique with some actions to take by some that. So it's like people care about what we're doing. At least some of people care a lot about what we're doing. So it's worth being more transparent because as time goes by, they will be able to give us even more constructive feedback, right? If they know the inside details to some extent of what we're doing, they will be able to give us even more productive feedback, which also was true. And then one, yeah, th these are the two main reasons, I think. So like th those two things helped a lot. Another benefit is that because we're so transparent, kind of on the trust things as well, you know, more people hear about us, right? So yes, not everyone is a marketer, but because we post our result, like every year we post our results in public, that gets shared quite a bit. There's a new newsletter sponsor or potential partner for some other things that we do. So kind of helps with, with just the awareness side of things as well. But yeah, still some downside, of course, but I think overall that, I think that overall is still a positive decision, like a good decision that we made. Yeah, it's funny actually in, in the, the kind of the, creator community on youtube i mean I, I really kind of first it, it first came to my mind when i saw pat flynn who runs a site called smart passive income but he did a very kind of prolific podcaster video creator and he made a, a kind of a whole bunch of videos and i always remember watching this video once and he was sharing his income and and basically said this is what we did this month right and he would say we made this money from courses this money from this this money from this so i think he had about maybe six or seven different streams of income Right. And one of them was he, he'd made like, so there's a company called Bluehost who do hosting. And he was basically, mm -hmm. I think this video was like maybe six or seven minutes long. And the video showed you how you could register a domain, create a website or, or go, like set up a hosting account and create a website in five minutes using WordPress. Right. And he was making something like $50,000 a month, right. In affiliate commissions from Bluehost by recommending their hosting platform because Basically, everyone was just copying what he was doing in the video. So he'd made a video, showed you how registered domain. I think he was using GoDaddy. So he made commission on domains regist registration. He made money on the Bluehost, right? You know, and, and he was also helping people. So that's the thing that's always kind of bothered me. When people talk about affiliate, you think it's like grubby and everything else. And the reality of it is, is you're helping people. I mean, ultimately, this is somebody who's got a, a burning desire to create a business. They want to get something off the ground, right? And this is somebody who's pr providing a kind of like an, an A to Z, like this is step one, do this, step two, do this, step two, three, do this. Yeah. And the end result is you have a website. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a good website. There's a whole bunch of marketing stuff you need to throw into the mix as well, right? But at least you're up and running, right? You're, you're off to the races at that point. And then from there, you can kind of watch other YouTube videos of other people helping you to, to on your journey towards where you want to kind of be as a digital marketer, right? So, so for me, it's like, again, I have no issue at all with anyone that makes their money from recommending other products that they don't know themselves. But, you know, again, if, if people own their own products, great, fair place in them as well. I think the most important thing is it's got to be a value exchange. You've got to provide them with value and get, you know, get, give, give something back in return. And then, you know, there's, there's kind of no issue. So, so Manu, one, one of the things that I, I always try and ask my guests is what is it that makes you think, makes a good publisher? What, what's, you know, you've got some really amazing brands, right? Household name brands as your newsletter sponsors, right? So I'm curious, one, you know, what makes a good publisher? And two, how did you kind of get those brands like uh, Salesforce and HubSpot? What was it that you persuaded them to kind of come on board as sponsors for the uh, newsletter? Mm -hmm. Well, I can start with part one, 
with what what I think makes a good publisher. And so, of course, it's the content itself. But I want to go a little bit deeper into that because just saying it's the content is kind of vague. Like, of course, that, that's the obvious answer. But what would good content be? And I think there's two things with content, especially it, depending on the format, but for something that's free, for something that's supposed to be kind of like easy to digest, it has to not be too lengthy. Like, of course, we have some things that are deeper, but those we, we provide for people who are more, they want to learn something more in depth. So those are more like courses, research reports, things like that. So for the free public, uh, for the free newsletters, it has to be easy enough to digest and two things, one is with length and then just the, the tone of it, right? So that's probably the hardest one that you have to practice more, like what kind of tone do you use to write? Uh, the typical advice is, oh, just write like you speak. I think that's very incomplete and very often plainly wrong because not everyone is a good speaker. Not everyone is a good public speaker. Not everyone is a good just speaker in general. So then if they write as they speak, it would be awful. But what that I think what people try to say with that is be more informal, be talking to one person, like one to one rather than one to many. And then from my point of view, I think most of the good content out there these days, especially a written one, does a good mix of educating, informing, but also entertaining. So like the entertainment part of it is still useful. Of course, you don't have, you should not do like the thing where you just try to make puns within every sentence. So that's the skill, like you have to practice and see where, where, where the right balance is. But, you know, having some insider jokes about, let's say, the marketing industry in our case, or what's, you know, pop culture references that are still relevant for people in our readership, right? So we know that we don't have readers, like most of our readers are still within, like, I would say, 25 to 45 years old. So if we do references for that kind of uh, generation, people get it. We don't do references for people that are super young or super old. Like we don't do like for, you know, it's not going to be for my grandparents that are like uh, 75 towards 80 years old. Doesn't make sense. So we try to be very much aware of that. And then lastly, Aside from the good content side of things is something that I feel strongly about, especially for email is being honest with yourself and cleaning your list properly. So you want to have the data as real as possible so that you have real people with real intent. It's obvious that for the web in general, that's, that's an issue, but also for email, there are still bots, right? Apple mail, privacy opens newsletters, opens emails all the time. It's not real people. There's uh, corporate firewalls that click links to check for any sort of uh, malware and you know phishing links, whatever. And those, if you're not careful, they get recorded within your stats and you think you're in, you have an engaged audience, but you have to clean that up and see like what are the real people with real intent? What's that looking like? So work on the content side of things, try to be entertaining and educating and you know with, it, with the information then be honest with the data that you're kind of analyzing to complete self. So I think with those two combined, iterating with it, you can make, that's what makes a good publisher and makes good content. And I think that's what ended up getting us, you know, those kind of sponsors. And because you're going to say like, how, how did we get them? And the lucky thing for us is that it was all inbound. They came to us, we didn't go to them. <laughs> so... Make it right. I mean, so that, that, that's the thing. Like we just have a link of saying advertise with us in the newsletter. And then we have a page where we explain a few more details and the contact form. And then, you know, Salesforce contacted us, HubSpot contacted us, SEMrush, they were also inbound for us. So all of these things, people came to us. Of course, then we tried our best to provide a good service when it comes to what content we publish and the results that they get. But we, we didn't, it wasn't us going to them and saying like, Hey, look, we have this great newsletter. Um, it was them coming to us. Of course we do some outbound and there are some good sponsors from outbound efforts as well, but the, the biggest wins were just the fact that these highlights would like the, some of the biggest sponsors came to us. We didn't go to them. So I think, I think that's kind of a sign that made me positive that we're doing, uh, we're on the right path with the content side of things and like we're creating the right impression. And, and obviously you, your, your portfolio of kind of publishing titles, if you like, has it increased from just being stack marketer, you now have three, you have tactics and psychology of marketing. 
and again, we were talking in the green room and I understand that tactics is kind of like, it's a sort of homegrown, you, you built it yourself and psychology of marketing, you kind of like acquired the, the business. So, so what, again, what, what was the kind of process for that? How, how did you kind of go out, out looking for an acquisition and what was the, the kind of, you know, the criteria that you, you kind of had for, for, uh, for doing that? Just in case there are other people that maybe have a similar thing that maybe they're looking for either to kind of sell Right, so they may go, Manny, I want to talk to you, or looking to kind of, you know, to acquire others. Maybe you can kind of provide some helpful insight into that. Yeah, of course. Around a year ago, a little bit more than a year ago, we thought like, how do we expand? Like, how do we grow our business? And one clear decision was that we want to stay within the marketing space. So we don't want to expand within other industries or other niches. We want to do more within the marketing space itself. And then one way to do that is like, okay, what are other marketing newsletters that are uh, that complement the daily newsletter that we have right now? So content that the same people might want to read. So just having, you know, more interesting content for the same type of audience, or at least a very big overlap for the audience. And just looked around, looked at what I was reading within my inbox and psychology of marketing was one of the newsletters that I was reading. I reached out to the founder. We actually did some cross promotions before I saw that the audience is nicely engaged. So it's like the, the numbers that he was talking about were real. So like it was real people with real intent as much as possible. Like there's always uh, some room for error there, but, um, better than uh, much better than the average newsletter. So I reached out after a few of these collaborations and asked, you know, what's your plans in the future? Would you be open to selling the newsletter? I'm like just starting that conversation pretty straightforward in that way. One thing led to another. And then when looking into, you know, what kind of, you know, what kind of plans he had, how, what we want to do, just things fit well together. So we decided to acquire it. So this was more based on like there, it's complementary content to what we have already. And then another reason we might acquire a newsletter is if it's exactly the same purpose of what we have now. So let's say if there's another daily, like Monday to Friday newsletter that provides news for marketers, but the person who owns it, I cannot monetize it well, and they want to sell it. We might also be interested in acquiring that. So th those are like the two reasons, like one reason, extra content that like the concept and the content that we think is useful for, for the audience that we have already and kind of a reason to acquire is like, yeah, we could build it on our own and try to grow it, but why not start it off with, you know, 25,000 subscribers and, you know, a good library of content that exists already. If it's the right price, why start from zero or it's never zero in our case now, but why start from so much, so many steps back. And yeah, and did that you, also, sorry, did you do any fundraising for that at all to kind of um, make the acquisition or was it something that you just kind of bought? No, no, no. So it was something we could afford to do ourselves. So that was not something that we raised money for. We, we kind of thought like, yeah, we would just have less profit for the year, but that's fine. And because this kind of acquisition will be like, won't pay off in two months or anything silly like that. It will take a little bit to pay off, but we're pretty optimistic and pretty confident about it. I think we also in now that it's one year later, we were pretty accurate in that assessment of how things would go. So yeah, pretty happy about it, but we didn't have to raise funds. So since it was a newsletter with around when we acquired, I think like 25 ish thousands, so I would have to check exactly, but let's say around 25,000 active subscribers, the price was something we could afford directly. So that was, that was pretty, pretty good for us. Cool. And what do you see as being the next big challenge for kind of digital marketing publishers or di digital marketing just generally? I mean, I'm, I'm always looking at the, you know, the press. And again, I mean, Stack Market is one of the emails. I get it on a daily basis, right? I love getting it because it's like it's it just pulls out, sucks out all the salient points from all the, again, I could probably set up Google Alerts, but for me, it's much better to have one in one place. And as you say, you, you add your own kind of tone and and you know opinions to it so for me in some respect it's great to kind of get that that digest kind of on a daily basis comes in around that right sort of time i'm in the middle of you know having a break for coffee or something like that and just kind of skim through it look at the articles click through read them in more detail if, it, if it's appropriate and then go about the rest of my day so for me that that's that's great well what do you see digital marketing and publishers specifically kind of like what what do you see the challenges for the next so three to five years 
Ooh, three to five years is hard to say. I would I would be able to guess more like the next one to two years. <laughs> so a lot of publishers, yeah, a lot of publishers are still ad supported. I mean, like including ourselves, most like ninety percent of our revenue or something around there is through ad revenue. And I think I would say it's not secret. Some people disagree on this, but I think it's not a secret that a lot of marketing budgets are lower, advertising budgets are lower compared to you know like a year ago, or at least they haven't grown enough compared to other things that you know, other expenses that have grown like essentially people are more limited with the how they yeah. how they spend money so ad supported businesses i think yeah, they have to they have to provide better results to get the same amount of revenue better performance better results whatever might that might mean so that's something they can't really control but i think it is a challenge to navigate i'm pretty sure a lot of non-marketing publishers as well have that challenge and you probably hear it in the news uh, that they're you know buzzfeed i think is one example where yeah, it was like the sweetheart of the, co- the content publishing space a few years ago. And now it's like, will it survive type of scenario? I, I haven't checked like in detail, but it's just not looking great for them. Yeah. So everyone has these sort of challenges. They have to navigate them well. And then something that maybe is a little bit more within their control for publishers is the fact that they have they will have less tracking and data on their readers, their users. That's something that has been a trend for a few years, but that's still continuing, right? Like that's not, that's not done yet. We're not over with, it's not over yet. Uh, for email, I obviously mentioned already that the Apple Mail privacy protection opens all emails. Therefore you like you have inflated open rates. So you kind of, you, you're celebrating things that are not real. Yeah. Um, so the metric the rates as well, bot clicks cool. is using to measure your success may well change kind of in the next 12 to 18 months. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you probably have to, yeah, you have to look deeper into your overall like funnel. Like, can you get, you know, like what's the revenue that your audience is generating for your sponsors or things like that? Of course, you cannot know that for sure. But from that abstraction, you can look like what's what's the cost for a real click, things like that. So I think that, that that's going to be a challenge in general for, for publishers as well, just making sure that they're not, lying to themselves it's like they, they need to get more details of like what's what's really happening what's true intent what's real people what who are real people what are they doing yeah that, that's kind of how i see it now and then every depending on what type, kind of publisher you are you will have different solutions or different extra challenges yeah because I, I i always remember way back in 2009 when i went to work i sold i sold my affiliate network to an ad sales house and and they were representing some really significantly big brands and they were basically their job was to help maximize the return on selling the ad inventory on the site and and i mean ultimately you know email was a big chunk of the the kind of deliverability Mm -hmm. we would obviously have a lot of banner ads and everything else but email was also one of those things where we had a big big email database and we would send out a certain number of emails what would happen is is that there would be some advertisers would be disappointed with the results they got. And I've always kind of said, well, you know, in some respects you could argue and say, well, the onus is on the, the um, advertiser to kind of write good sponsored messages in emails that are going out, right? It's not for you to kind of like dictate what, what actually happens, but you know, there would be a certain amount of deliverability that we would, we would give them. They would get certain amount of results. Sometimes you know, we'd be unhappy so we would end up like maybe throwing another million impressions on banner ads to kind of compensate them for, to try and sort of make the numbers up, right? So it was always one of those things that it, in some respects, I always kind of said it was a little bit like juggling chainsaws. Like you, you had all these different <laughs> kind of uh, obligations that you were trying to fulfill. You had to try and maximize the return for the publisher, but also give the advertisers a good return. So it was always kind of like you're trying to sort of provide a good environment for the, um, the relationship relationships to, to thrive right and it wasn't always mm-hmm. easy as it as it could have been right so you know again sometimes there would be a poor brand fit so people were concerned about brand con- brand concerns brand safety that type of thing i mean that's one of the challenges that that you know i guess probably in the publishing space you know let, let's say for arguments that you get like a an adult porn network that wants to kind of run ads on your newsletter you might go Sorry, that's not that's not going to be a good fit for our audience. Even though you're turning away, yeah, money, yeah. right? You've got to be respectful of the people that that kind of are in your database, right? Otherwise, you'll get the biggest number of unsubscribes in in a day, kind of going. Really. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. It, it, it's it, it's that. And actually, like one of the points that you mentioned is something that we try to solve because um, you said like, hey, maybe it's your offer that's not presented in the best way possible. One thing that we do, it's something that we do differently because a lot of publishers try to do that, especially for email publishing these days for newsletters. Um, we write the copy for the sponsors and then they just make some final adjustments, but we write it in a way that we know, like we learn from all the experience, which is kind of hard to put into a checklist to give the sponsor, like within our experience, we know some things. Um, so some things are just a feel now, but also we have some guidelines that keep the copy, you know, clear, keeps it clear, concise. It keeps it on point for our readership and it keeps it in tone with the newsletter. So a lot of people find the sponsor placements as well they find them interesting it's not like a banner ad that or like an interstitial that just pops up when you don't want it so it's part of the experience of course not everyone likes them that's fine but for some people it is just a normal part of the experience to also read about interesting sponsors interesting interesting tools and they like the way we present them but if we let the sponsor only do that in their tone in their voice i'm 100 certain because we even let some sponsors do that it won't perform as good as it does when we write it. Yeah. yeah. At least on average, there's always going to be exceptions. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, in the podcasting world, I think it's quite interesting that a lot of the the ads that you'll hear, they call, they call them host read. In other words, like, so if somebody wanted my podcast, right, then they would basically get me to read their ad for them, right, rather than them reading the ad, because I think sometimes that's what people are looking for. They're looking for, you know, they're looking for you to, to provide that that kind of, you know, you read it and then that way kind of like it builds more trust, right? The thing I like about your newsletter is you've got the kind of a combination of the, you know, the, it's almost like a information sandwich. So you've got information that's a, a relevance, the ad, and then information at the bottom. So it's kind of like a, a nice, easy, it kind of goes through. So, so Manu, I, I, I'm, again, we could probably talk for absolute hours, but I'm, I'm going to kind of wrap things up now. Thank you so much for, for being a guest on the podcast. If there was one thing that you want to kind of talk about specifically, maybe for my audience to, that they might be interested in kind of learning more about, what would it be? Um, <laughs> Sorry, like, can you repeat the question a bit? Because I didn't quite get what you meant. Yeah, so 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 obviously I want to try and give the audience something that they can go, oh, based on that conversation, that's what I want to do next. It might be to kind of obviously subscribe to the newsletter, right? So where can they do that? <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, it'll be in the show notes, but just maybe kind of talk about it just in case they don't read the show notes. Sure, uh, yeah. So to subscribe to the newsletter, you just have to go to stackmarketer.com. So it's free to check out. If you don't like it, I'll subscribe. Not a problem. So that's all good for us. Uh, I know that you know different people have different tastes or different needs. So that's totally fine. Uh, no hard feelings there. And well, then uh, I'd be perhaps if you I, want to. I promise people will like it, right? Again, I've been like a subscriber. <laughs> you could probably check on your database, but I've been a subscriber on the stack market, the database for an awful long time, right? And <laughs> I don't necessarily click through to stuff but I read it every day it comes through. So it's definitely worth worth subscribing if you haven't already subscribed. That's awesome to hear. And yeah, I also, I agree with you. Like I like, I still read it, right? So uh, I'm still a user or a reader of the newsletter as well, not just the creator of it. So I'm just a founder. And then, uh, yeah, if people find these kind of publishing newsletter type of businesses interesting, they could follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn. In both cases, if you search for Emmanuel Chinka, so just my name, you should be able to find me. Yeah, and I have my profile picture there, so it should be easy to recognize if there's any, like another person that shares my name, which is not so common though. So there on social, I mostly share things like, you know, let's say behind the scenes or learnings that, that have happened over the recent time from the, from the newsletter space, from just being a, an online entrepreneur. And yeah, that's, if you are interested in these kind of things, I think you, uh, you'll find uh, my posts interesting as well. Uh, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been great to be here. Um, really appreciate you having me. And of course, if other, if any of the listeners have specific questions, they can reach out with them. I tend to answer with them like, 24 hours at least to be like hey i have to get back to you later if it's too detailed of a question 
but usually if you reach out to me with a with a dm or something i'll be happy to to answer any more specific questions that you have that's brilliant so that that that's that's the episode kind of in the can thank thanks for you for listening into it they can obviously support the podcast by following and subscribing on your favorite podcast platform and for bonus thanks if you wouldn't mind leaving a review and sharing the episode with a friend or colleague who you know that this episode will vibe with that would be amazing uh, all of Manu's details will be available in the show notes along with the transcript and any resources that we discussed on the episode. If you are watching this episode on video, there is a playlist here where you can watch or listen to other episodes of the podcast and you can do the same thing but without the pictures over on Apple or Spotify. <laughs>